Hi everyone, this is Jonathan from Hexplore it here. Uh, we are going to take a look today at the domain of Mirrors and Noctis. I'm going to show you how to set up your first game and to get started. We're going to go through a few game turns uh, with some heroes that I've created here and uh, it will be kind of a whirlwind of what's new in the domain of Mirrors and Noctis. So if you're familiar with the Hexplorit products, uh, this should be a pretty easy jumping point for you into the series. Um, I will take it slow and, and go through some of the other um, uh, functions and, and systems that we've got as well to capture those of you who are new to the series. So thanks for joining me today. I hope you guys are all staying uh, safe and, and healthy and playing lots of games. So let's dive right in. All right, so the first thing you're going to do when you are getting ready to play a game of Hexplore It, you are going to create your hero. Um, I've created actually two heroes for this kind of mock-up. Um, <clears throat> I've got a Warlock Dark Elf and a Ratkin Witch uh, on our, on our, uh, in our group here. When you start the game, you're going to select a race, a role, and you're going to also select a keepsake uh, at random and place that keepsake underneath your hero mat. Now keepsakes are new in Domain and they uh, have a chance of activating after your hero dies. So, and it, it is all dependent on your hero's defend rank. Uh, the higher defense that you have, the more chance that this keepsake will activate upon your untimely demise. Now, keepsakes offer a way for you to actually keep on going. Uh, your spirit persists after death, and your whole goal, once your keepsake activates, is to reduce the ranks that you have to do um, some neat things to help the group. And so each keepsake has different powers, um, and what you're going to do is basically place that over your hero placard, and that replaces the masteries that you have for your hero. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if our heroes will die in this in this uh, kind of playthrough, but I did um, select those at random just to to have them. Now you don't look at those until you actually um, <clears throat> until you actually die, um, and that is because each uh, ability on the keepsake will basically cost you different types of stats. So we don't want you to know what stats are going to be important to your ghost uh, after you die. So um, for instance, um, the higher health and, and vitals you might have uh, could give you more power as, as your keepsake activates, uh, or it could be your skills or abilities. All right, so I've got my heroes taken care of. Um, if you are looking for more information on how to build your heroes, we do have additional links that um, can take you to um, videos that show that. Once you have your heroes figured out, you're gonna place your board on your game table. Now, I've just placed this in the default setup. Each of the four quadrants that you see in the center of this map are completely customizable to their, sh to their uh, position on the board. So you can come up with some really fun um, orientations for your, for your game. On the top of your screen here, you're gonna see we have a day bar. And this also has the day deck. Um, and on the bottom of your screen, we have the night bar and the night deck. Now, new to domain is um, we actually have two separate circumstance decks. And so um, when you are moving, every movement phase in domain, uh, you are going to select whether you're moving during the day, and that will allow you to experience some of the items on this side of the, of the game board, or if you're going to be moving during the night, and that will allow you to experience what is on this side of the night bar. Now, we also have a few different slots. Uh, we have our power-up slot here for your power-up deck. And new to domain are encounters uh, in their own deck. And that is on the night side. Okay, um, now when you actually sit, sit down to play your game, you're gonna be giving your dice to your heroes like usual. Um, we have two new dice in the domain of Mirsa Noctis. We have a 12-sided die that we call the moon die. 
and we have three-sided dice, uh, which are blood collectors. Now, these are going to show up in villages across the map, and uh, they are actually going to be um, siphoning blood from the local populace. And uh, the more blood that they siphon, the stronger uh, Mirza Noctis becomes. And he is our uh, kind of our end uh, villain in this in this volume. So, all right, let's take a look at the map a little bit. We have several locations on the map um, revealed on our on our quadrants. Um, two different types appear on the quadrants, and that um, that is villages in Goldenrod. Okay, and they are numbered one through seven. There are seven total. And then we have red boss locations. Um, and these locations come in two varieties. If there is a number in the boss location, then it corresponds to a specific boss in uh, your on your boss placards. Okay, so we have boss number four uh, right here on the map. And so that is going to correspond with the fourth boss. Uh, one of the fourth bosses. We are planning for uh, multiple bosses of multiple levels in this volume. Um, hopefully we can unlock those. Um, and a second type of boss location, and this is a more interesting, a slightly more interesting one, and that is the random boss location. So a lot of these locations on the map in red are random boss locations. You're not sure what boss you're going to face here. Um, and there are more of them on the map, so you're going to have to move carefully so that you don't wander accidentally into one of these locations. Um, so those are a, a fun addition to Domain. Let's take a look at the other types of locations uh, on the map. Now, with Domain, you have um, hex tiles, just like uh, normal Hexplorit uh, games. And um, if you can kind of see here, I'm going to show off two different uh, types of locations in uh, rows that rose colored um, are monasteries. And monasteries are kind of a safe haven for the heroes. Um, if you go to a monastery, you're going to be able to heal. You're going to be able to get rid of any afflictions or conditions you might have. Um, and you can purchase items. Now, um, there are four monasteries in the hex tiles, and that is the um, locations outside of your map, so you're gonna have to go find them. And in the purple here, we have um, we have crypts. Now there are also four crypts in the domain of Mirza Noctis, and these crypts begin locked when you first start the game. So the moment you place one of these down, you're going to take a locked uh, token and place it over the, the top of this location. The moment you unlock a crypt, monasteries get more powerful. Um, so all of these, all of this item, the, these equipment and items, magical items, have been locked away down into the dungeon of Crest Vitalia. And so the, um, the blood lord, uh, Mirza Noctis, he actually has taken all of his agents and they have they've put all of this stuff down on, in the underground. So the more um, crypts you unlock, the more items you are going to become, uh, you're going to have available to you to purchase in monasteries. All right, so that is crypts. Um, what else? We have one other location, and that is Mirza Noctis's castle. Um, let's see if I can find that in here. Sure enough. So we have Mirza Noctis's castle, um, and that is going to be your end uh, location to go and fight the, the bad guy, the main villain. Now, he might come to you if you uh, kind of dally and do not get your... Um, yourself moving. Um, if the blood pool ra raises to 100, he will come in and find you. All right, so that is the game locations on the board. A few other locations to note um, that are not actually, um, ha they don't have a border, and that is these really bright yellow orange mountain peaks. Now, um, actually they're, they're called mountain ranges in, in this game. Um, it's a slightly different mechanic than Mountain Peaks in um, any of our previous games. Now, Mountain Ranges, you cannot move into these locations without having your scaling gear. Um, and 
Uh, it's one of the items that you can purchase. I believe it's purchasable in the uh, a scaling kit. It's purchasable in a village. Okay, so these locations in orange, um, I cannot go into those locations at the beginning of the game. So that's going to mean you have to go the long way around. Um, and we've built our mountain ranges to be um, in certain positions so that uh, you have to kind of pick your, the way that you move um, quite cautiously. Speaking of moving cautiously, in this game, um, if you're new to this series, there are four different ways that you can move in the uh, Hexplorer um, universe, and that is to camp. You're not moving anywhere. You're, you're basically going to heal uh, some vitals. You're going to get a, a, a chance to gain a bonus on some of your skills that you might roll for that, for that turn. Um, you can move cautiously, and this is if you're moving along a river or a road. Um, so if you are moving cautiously, there will be some benefits to you um, throughout your game turn. You can avoid getting a kind of a perilous card that you might draw. Um, there is moving normally, and that is basically moving up to your movement rate. You're not moving on a river or a road. You're just kind of um, making your trek out into the wilderness. And then finally, there's reckless movement. And reckless movement allows you to move a little bit farther, uh, and you take a little bit of energy drain, um, damage basically, that, that affects your energy vital, and can dip into health if you don't have enough energy to spend. Okay, now these four types of movement options are actually, um, there, is, there is a sort of um, strategy involved in Domain of Mirrors and Octus. Now the Blood Lord is able to keep tabs on pretty much everything that's happening in this location. He is cultivating um, a ritual of some kind that the heroes have to try and unravel. And if you're moving slowly on the board, that gives him the opportunity to have eyes on you. And so you will actually be in more jeopardy of um, suffering some, some poor um, uh, things that might happen um, based on, on, on just that. Now, the faster you move, the more you can keep ahead of the, um, of the Blood Lord. So Mirza Noctis doesn't have a chance to really keep a good eye on you when you're moving really quickly and, and, and far into the countryside. Um, and that's represented by the blood modifiers, uh, the villain modifiers uh, in this movement placard that you can see on, on the screen here. So that's the, the movement phase. Um, now, after the movement phase, you will be um, basically rolling your skills. Each hero has three skill dice, uh, yellow for explore, green for navigate, and blue for survival. And um, based on how you moved, that will affect um, what dice you roll, and it will affect uh, if you have any, any modifiers to those rolls. For instance, if you camp and, and you don't move, you're gonna have a bonus to, um, to rolling those skills. Now, navigate, the green die, is based on your navigate score. And if you um, basically have a success in navigate, you have a chance of uh, staying in place. You will not wander. Now, half the group has to actually make this roll in order for the group not to wander. Wandering in uh, Hexplore it, basically, let's say we've ended our movement right here on our, on our map. If during the skill phase, we roll our green, uh, navigate, and um, half of us fail, uh, uh, let's say over half of us actually, in a two-player game, let's say both of our heroes fail, we're gonna roll a d6 against our wander die uh, here, our, our wander graphic here. And that's going to determine which uh, spot we've wandered into. So this could be bad if we're not moving cautiously, and let's say we end here next to a boss location, if we rolled a two on that wander graphic, we would actually wander into the boss location and then we would have to face whatever is lurking uh, in the shadows there. Okay, um, your yellow die is explore and that is going to allow your heroes to gain some treasure uh, in the form of gold. Um, you found something that you can sell, um, you, you managed to, to grab something of value. 
Now your blue is based on uh, your hero's ability to find um, food and survive in the wilderness. Now any hero who has a food rating um, of one or higher will need to eat if they fail that roll. Uh, so each of your races has a food rating on it and so that is tied to your, to your survival. It is possible for you to gain um, critical successes during this phase of the game and there are some special bonuses that you will gain uh, and that allows you to, um, to get some, some nice things. Some of them are group bonuses uh, and some of them are just for your hero. Okay, so that is the skill phase. Um, let's take a look at the circumstance phase next. Now the circumstance phase is um, based on the day and night here. Now, I didn't mention this during the movement phase, the first phase of the game, each turn the players are going to choose whether they're moving during the day or during the night. And that will determine which side we are rolling on. Um, so. In the circumstance phase, you're gonna roll a six-sided die. Um, and let's say we've moved during the day, and so we will roll against uh, the numbers that are on this bar. We have four slots, one, two, three, four, on the day bar, and we have four slots on the night bar, one, two, three, four. A roll of a five or a six will always be a draw from the encounter deck whether you've moved during the day or during the night. So a five or a six will always return a encounter to the, to the group. All right, um, so after the circumstance phase, we have the event phase. Now, events will happen if you are on one of the bordered uh, locations. Um, so village, boss location, uh, monastery, or crypt. Uh, and sometimes will happen on other locations. It may be a investigation that you've found, or it might be a discovery uh, that you've that you've unearthed. So there might be other uh, events that happen um, in in the in this phase. Now, if you have the ability to experience multiple events in the same uh, game turn, you can do that. So there are items that allow you to move uh, during the event phase. Um, and if you move and, and get to another location, then you can, you can actually have multiple events. It's one way to try and keep ahead of uh, Mirza Noctis. All right, finally, in the, at the end of the game turn, after we've done that, then we have the Mirza Noctis, our, our villain is going to be acting. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to um, add blood to the blood pool based on however many collectors, that's these red dice, are on the villages. So, so let's, say, let's say one collector appeared on uh, village three. Let's say we've been playing for a while and we've got three collectors on village two. Um, the numbers indicate the amount of blood you are going to be increasing the blood pool by. So a quick count, three plus one is four. So each game turn, the, the blood will be increasing by four. Uh, there could be other factors that increase this as well or decrease. Okay, now uh, let's take a look at um, the bars, the circumstance bars. We're gonna, we're gonna draw our cards and then we'll probably walk through a couple of our game turns. <clears throat> so uh, let's draw our knight cards first. I'm gonna place these down here. All right, a couple things to note. New to domain are interrupt cards. Now when you first play the game, any interrupt cards that you reveal will be shuffled back into the deck. Now these cards are denoted by a yellow ribbon that say interrupt on them. And you can see we've drawn one for the night, um, the night bar here. Now, normally when the moment these cards are drawn and uh, flipped over and, and, and placed, that is when you would play the top part of this card and uh, you would experience anything that um, is going on with this particular card. So interrupts will generally happen after <clears throat> you've played something else. So it's really important to um, try to be ready for, for you know anything that, that might occur. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, 
this just is the first card um, that we've placed in the in the game. I'm gonna be basically putting that back into the deck. We don't start with any interrupt cards on the board. All right. Um, next to talk about is the heroic card that I've drawn. Now, in the domain of Mirza Noctis, we have a card <clears throat> that corresponds to each of the roles in the game. And this card allows your hero to have a chance to get a bit stronger, um, to increase your abilities in a specific way. So for instance, this one that we're looking at here, if the cursed one is in play, then you're gonna be able to um, play this card. And in the rule book, this is described. Um, if you do not have this role in, uh, in play, then you're simply going to also discard this. So for instance, we are playing with the warlock and the witch. Um, we're not playing with the cursed one, so I'm going to put this one aside. And generally, you just you know put it aside and would not encounter it again. I'm just putting it in the deck for now. All right, so I've re-pulled um, the cards that I do not start the game with, the uh, interrupt card and the heroic card that do not correspond to... Um, to the beginning of the game. As you can see, we have uh, two cards here with a rune reward at the bottom. Um, now generally, these rune reward cards are investigations. They also have the little looking glass icon on them and that allows you, the magnifying glass, and that allows you to see that that is a, your investigation. Now, these locations correspond to a lo location on the board. So for instance, this one here is Graveyard Golem, and this is on Hex Tile E in this little lower left location. And then this one here is uh, our survival uh, card, and this is on Hex Tile K. So both of these locations are off the map. They are not revealed. Um, we have to basically go out and, and search for these locations in order to do one of these, one of these cards. Um, so let's go ahead and flip over for the day deck. Place them upside down here so you can see them better. Lots of investigations. All right, so as you can see, um, I have revealed um, four cards on the day bar here. We have a treasure, and then we have three investigations. Again, they have a rune reward. We've got a lot of uh, red runes on the board at the moment. We have a red, red, green, red, and green. Now, runes in this game are the main way that your heroes will gain power. Um, and um, that is something that you're going to want to collect um, in the domain of Mirza Noctis. You're going to uh, collect these strategically, so you can either gain matching sets. Um, there are three types. You have a red rune, uh, which is represented by a circle, a green rune, which is represented by the diamond, and a blue rune, which is represented by a triangle. So again, you can collect these in sets or you can collect the matching uh, pairs um, uh, or, or, or matching types. So the more you have, the more you get to turn in to different locations strategically and that allows your heroes to gain a bunch of power. Okay, so let's look at the three on the top here. I see two that are revealed. So um, in fact, we are going to place uh, rune stones now these rune stones are a unlock that we're looking to to um, unlock during the campaign and they're uh, basically little beads um, stone beads glass beads that have the symbol of the rune screen screen printed on the bottom and these are going to be placed on your board to represent the different locations that you can go to gain them so for instance this one here luring shadows is going to be on, uh, let's see, hex tile A, and that's gonna be right here. And then this one is Hidden Giant, and that is also on hex tile A. I'm gonna place that one here. So we know that we could go to these two locations to attempt to gain a red rune stone, okay? All right, so I think that's about it for the setup. Um, I also have our dungeon decks here. 
uh, on the side uh, of the board. They each correspond with the rune type, so red, green, and blue. And uh, we can gain runes by entering the dungeon. And this is done by um, unlocking a crypt, and then you can go down into the dungeon in a crypt location. Um, I'm not going to jump into the dungeon just yet for this playthrough, but it is worth noting that um, the more dungeon entrances you unlock, the easier it's going to be for you to move around the board. Because you can enter the dungeon, let's say here, in spot two, go into the dungeon, um, and then exit in a different location. So if you have revealed Crypt 2 over here, and you've revealed Crypt 1 over here, you could jump back and forth in um, by, by taking the dungeon. So that's a fun new mechanic. And we need to determine which village we're going to start in. And to do that, we are going to declare <clears throat> whether we're moving during the day or during the night for our first game turn. Now, I see <clears throat> a treasure and two, uh, uh, two investigations that we could be able to, um, to use or, or to make use of. So I think we're going to we're going to move during the day, and that's going to allow us to try and, and roll on this, this bar here. We have an affliction uh, on the bottom of the night bar here, so I can see us moving during the day to try and gain clues, uh, which we haven't really talked about yet. I can get to that in the circumstance phase. So, in order to determine your beginning city, <clears throat> you're going to roll a six-sided die. If you decided to move during the night, you are going to add a one to that die. Otherwise, you're just going to use the result. So if we're moving during the day, we're going to roll a d6, five, we start in the fifth city. If we were moving during the night, that five would have been plus one, so we start in the sixth city. So fifth city all the way over to the edge of the map over here. All right, so before we begin, uh, we're going to allocate our beginning uh, equipment. So at the beginning of the game, the entire group gains six rank one gear upgrades to be given to any of the heroes at the table. Now, um, I've given the Warlock um, three, and I've given the Witch three, and they cannot be to the same stat. They're only the first rank uh, gear upgrade. Um, <clears throat> as well as uh, 10 gold for each hero, and you get three times your food rating um, in food. So our witch has a food rating of three. She begins the game with nine food, 10 gold, and then the three gear upgrades. My warlock has a food rating of two, so he begins the game with six uh, food, 10 gold, and uh, also three gear upgrades. Now, you are able to purchase items before you set off on your adventure, and uh, so I've done that. So I have um, hunter's gear that I purchased um, in the village and a few less, lesser potions for each of our heroes. And you can use the placards um, to look over what items are available to you. Um, so for instance, um, we, we have two placards that showcase the items. In, in play. One is a summary that shows um, both the monastery and village items in the game. It's located on the back of the battle mat. And of course you have the placard that corresponds with this location, the village, um, which also shows you the items that are available to purchase. So now that that is done, I think I'm ready to set out all right, so the first thing we do when we begin our game is we have chosen uh, during the initial setup to move during the day. So our first game turn uh, during the movement phase, we are choosing to move during the day. I'm going to move uh, across the map to reveal a few additional hex tiles. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and move one uh, down that way, and that will allow us to reveal two hex tiles on the board. All right, and it looks like we have um, a boss location, uh, a hex tile with no other locations on it. It is hex tile I, and we do not have any investigations on hex tile I. So I'll put that kind of down here, 
And then we have um, hex tile N, and this one has a monastery on it. And um, if you'll note, we actually have a river that runs all the way through this hex tile, so we could move cautiously there. Uh, unfortunately, our first movement was not on a river, so we can't count that as a full movement phase on the river. So we can't get there um, cautiously this turn, but if we wanted to, we could, we could do that next turn. So instead of stopping, we could stop if we wanted to, but we still have movement remaining. We move normally uh, at a rate of four hexes per turn. So we can continue our movement. And I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go one, two. So we've moved three. And we're gonna place another hex tile right in this location here, just to see what we, what we get. All right, now that one uh, also has uh, both a monastery and a crypt, as well as a boss location. So I think what we'll do is uh, we will go ahead and let's orient that this way. That is hex tile H. Let's see, do we have anything on H? E, K, J. So we do not have any uh, additional investigations on this location. We did just reveal a crypt, so we need to place a locked crypt token on this location. Uh, you have to place that token on there to denote that it is currently locked, and that means we can't go into the dungeon. You can still go into the crypt and, um, you know, activate your runes there, but you have to uh, unlock it before you can go down into the dungeon in that location. All right, so that is our movement phase. Do we want to move any any further? Let's move one a little bit closer that way. And uh, then what we'll do is we're going to roll our skills. <clears throat> now, if you'll note, we, we kind of went in a circle. Uh, we did move, uh, let's see, one, two, three. We moved four total. Uh, so that is moving normally. Uh, so that means we may wander. And if you'll note, we actually uh, are adjacent to a boss location. Maybe not a great move for our opening um, turn here, but that's okay. We're going to try it. So we're going to roll our skills. And that is for each hero uh, at the board. The Warlock has rolled a hex on Explore. He missed the other two, so we may wander because of him. Um, but let's take a look at what that hex does when you roll uh, a critical success during the skill phase. Something nice, something good happens. So we roll on Explorer. If you critically succeed your Explorer roll, uh, your hero gains two gold and each hero heals one lost health. Or you may place one clue on an open estimate investigation of your choice. So we can actually place a clue because of this um, uh, critical success. So I'll take one of the clue cubes. <clears throat> and I'm going to place it on one of the investigations of, of our choice. And I think what we'll do is let's place it on this Luring Shadows uh, one, which is the, the green one, um, because we should be able to, to do that one fairly easily. So we'll try and, and add it to that one. Now, looking at our witch, um, she made survival but missed everything else. So uh, we need to consume food for our warlock because he missed survival. And, um, and that's it. Now, both of us failed our navigate. So we are going to wander. And now this is where we're going to see if um, this was a bad decision on my part, uh, placing us so close to a boss. So let's go ahead and roll the d6. And it's a one. Oh, we lucked out. So we actually wandered in this direction based on our wander graphic here. All right, so that was the movement phase and the skill phase. Next is the circumstance phase. We're gonna roll a six-sided die on this side of the board, and we roll a four. So that means, check it out, we actually gain the engraved crossbow. Now this is a treasure. A body lays face down on the road. Deep gashes in his clothing and flesh suggest a rend and tear attack. This inquisitor met his end bravely. His opponent collapsed a few feet away, an arrow protruding from its eye socket. 
Each round of combat, you may spend one energy to fire a silver bolt in addition to your action. Deal health damage equal to either your explorer rank or half your attack rank. Uh, and a utility, if you are a utility hero, it looks like you gain double this treasure's wielder bonus. Now we have a striker and a sapper in the group, so we do not have a utility. And that's okay, we still gain this card and we gain the wielder bonus of plus one to attack. So I'm going to give... Uh, the engraved crossbow to our warlock, which is going to increase his attack by one. All right, so now the moment we have uh, consumed this slot or used this card, we're going to turn over another card in the stack. And it looks like we have another of these heroic cards. Now, we do not have a Foss Romancer in the party, so we can just get rid of this card. Uh, at the beginning of the game, you can certainly just take those out. All uh, right, and check it out. We have an Interrupt. Now, this is actually something that happens right away. The moment you draw an Interrupt card, you, you have to play it. So, the Missionary. The missionary joins the group and may re-roll the circumstance die once per turn. Okay, a kind of missionary named Poe seeks to travel to each monastery so that he can pass along the knowledge that's shared between them. Each time you bring him to a new monastery, gain this card's rune reward. Oh my gosh, check it out. We have two monasteries right next door to each other. So we are already going to be gaining some really nice rewards from this. So that is our circumstance phase. We're going to place this card back in its slot. It is currently active. Um, so we will place it there. And we will note on our battle mat <clears throat> that we have uh, the missionary, Poe. And he has six health, seven navigate. All right. <clears throat> All right. So now the next thing that happens is we have gone through the circumstance phase. We're going to have an event. Now, we are currently not on a event location. We do not have a discovery or an investigation uh, in this spot. So you skip that phase and we're going to go right into the villain phase. Now during the villain phase, the first thing that will happen is we add blood to the blood pool equal to the number of collectors on the board. This is the first turn of the game, just so there are no collectors on the board. So we will not add any and we will simply roll our moon die to see what the villain action is. Now, we have not gotten any modifiers to this roll because we did not move cautiously or um, recklessly, anything like that. Had we moved in those specific manners, uh, we would have had a modifier to this roll. So we're gonna roll a d12, and it's a 12. Oh, it's the worst roll again twice with no modifiers to the roll if another 12 is rolled immediately add one to the blood pool for each collector in play all right so roll again twice first one is a one each hero loses one gold or two food let's go with one gold all right so we've lost a little bit of gold and the next thing is a eight and an eight single one critical health damage. So one of us is going to take a critical wound. Now critical wounds in this game are a little, that's a new system. You can only um, suffer so many critical wounds until you actually die. Um, so let's take a look at that mechanic. On the back of your game turn placard, you'll have the keywords um, placard, and that is gonna give you all of the different things that you need to know. So, critical, any time a hero suffers at least one critical damage, they gain one critical wound. Now, critical wounds, each hero may only sustain a number of critical wounds equal to three plus their food rating. So, that would be a max six, and a max five for 
uh, our warlock and for our witch. So our witch has a food rating of three, so she can sustain six critical wounds. Our warlock has a food rating of two, so he can sustain five critical wounds. So if a hero suffers more than this, they immediately die. Critical wounds may not be removed by items, abilities, or effects that negate conditions. Each hero removes one instance of critical wounds from themselves anytime they camp. So camping will allow you to get rid of your critical wounds. All right, so we rolled the die twice. We're gonna figure out who takes that critical wound. We're going to roll target dice. Now target dice is a D10 roll, a uh, 10 sided die for each hero. And um, you're basically going to, um, the person with the highest roll is going to be the target. So uh, let's go with green for our warlock and yellow for our witch. 10 green, our warlock, uh, who can sustain five critical wounds, has now suffered one. And that critical uh, damage was one critical health damage, so we go down to seven total health, or seven current health out of eight. Okay, so that is the end of that game turn. We, we moved, we rolled skills, we wandered, uh, we rolled a circumstance, we, had, we got a treasure, and we have an escort now in the group, uh, the missionary. And uh, then we rolled for our villain. So this brings us to game turn number two. So this time, I believe we're going to, let's, let's go to the monastery, get that first green rune, because that's going to allow us to, um, to get you know, a, a pretty, pretty powerful, I think. So we're going to do that. We're going to move to one, two. Now that wasn't along our, a road or a river. So this is going to be considered cautious movement and we're probably going to wander. But again, we have the missionary who has a navigative seven. So hopefully he saves us from wandering. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is we've, we've moved. We're going to roll our skills. Our warlock rolls, and he actually gets another hex on explore. That's two turns in a row he rolled a hex. <clears throat> so we get uh, two more gold. Um, he missed navigate, and he missed survival. So we're going to consume some food here. Uh, then we rolled for the witch, and she made navigate and missed survival so she is going to consume her food and she missed uh, explore okay so let's roll our navigate for uh, Poe the missionary and he rolls a three so we actually uh, stay in this spot now we skip the circumstance phase because we are in a monastery and we move right into the event phase the event phase will trigger the uh, the fact that we gain, we've, we've brought the missionary to one of the monasteries. And so we gain a green rune that I think we're going to turn in immediately to this, uh, to this location. So let's take a look at that. We pull out our monastery placard here and we can see that we are currently um, in the monastery, this is number three. So this is the monas Monastery of Gask. So we are going to um, basically take that green rune and we're going to uh, mark a one in that location. And that's gonna denote that we have turned in one green rune here. Now, the first rune you impart to a monastery is worth one power up per hero. Mark the rune type in the table below, then discard it. And the second rune's rewards are determined whether it matches the first rune or not. So if we return to this one, um, the second rune that we impart will determine how we impart runes in the future here. We can either bring another green one, and that will mean that we can only bring green ones to this location. Or we can bring a different rune type. If we bring a different rune type, then we have to start collecting sets, and we cannot bring the same color again. All right, so there's some strategy to how we want to impart runes in the monasteries. So we gain a power up, each of us. So let's see, we have plus two, choose two stats. 
We must strike now while they are not while they are yet weakened, for as they grow in power, our chances dwindle. You know this. Okay, and then we have a plus one defend. Like pawns in a game, we are his pieces. He anticipated our movements once again. We cannot let him win the day. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and give those to our heroes. Plus two, choose two stats. That is awesome. Let's go ahead and we're going to increase hex to a five and um, energy uh, health by two. Now, our witch's hex ability has risen to five. And she has a rank four unlock. So at rank four, you may use hex outside of combat to take one affliction card in play or in the discard pile and gain it. Hex deals an additional six energy damage for each affliction you possess. So I see an affliction on the board that my witch can actually now pick up because she has a five uh, rank in, in hex. So I'm going to take that. She actually is going to gain uh, Polymorphed uh, as a Hex, and this is going to give her a little bit more power when she um, uses her abilities. Now, when we do that, um, she has to use her Mastery, so that is going to consume a little bit of energy. Um, and <clears throat> the next thing to note is we have to refill that card so here comes the the next card it is not a uh, interrupt card the abandoned seller okay and the next thing that happens is um we are currently in the event phase so we get to uh decide if we want to spend some some gold here now in the monastery, we have a bunch of items available to us. If you'll note, um, there the monastery placard is broken into four particular sections, and we only have access to the top section. Now, for each crypt that we unlock, we will actually gain the next section's um, uh, items. So we can purchase up to the canoe at this point, um, I think for now, I, I think we're going to just do some Blessed Rations and Swift Foot Elixir. So let's just do Swift Foot 1, Swift Foot 1, and that's 3 each. And Rations are 3 each. Actually, the Witch doesn't have any left, any gold left. So really, I only get one Ration. Uh, one blessed ration. We need to get some more, some more gold. All right. So that's going to be the end of our event phase. That moves us into the villain phase. And if you'll notice, we drew a really good power up card. And this power up card has the villain action modifier on it. So we are going to have a plus two bone, a plus two penalty to our roll uh, because Noctis has been has been kind of watching our every move. We move normally, so that's a zero modifier for movement. But we do have that plus two for our um, for our power up. So we're going to roll that d twelve, and it's a ten, which becomes a twelve. We have to roll twice. And again, if there were any blood collectors in villages, we would have increased the blood pool. The blood pool hasn't increased yet. So we're, we're lucky that he hasn't been getting any, any blood yet. We roll twice, and that is a seven. The group must face a tenacious encounter for their circumstance next turn. So whatever we draw for a circumstance, we have to fight it. It's tenacious. We cannot run away from it. Um, so that actually has potential to be pretty uh, problematic. All right, let's roll again. And it's a 10. Ah, it's a collector. A collector has arrived. So place a collector in a random village. We moved during the day. Um, so we're going to go ahead and roll a six-sided die. And we're going to see it's a hex. 
the collector is going to show up in the sixth village, which is right here. There is no collector there yet, so we're going to place a one, which denotes that one collector is there, and the blood meter, the blood pool will increase by one while that collector is, is there. All right, so we have to face a tenacious encounter next turn. That could be problematic. And check it out. If we wanted to get to this next monastery, we would have to go around the mountain range. We can't actually cross those orange mountain peaks, so we have to go the long way around. Uh, we might be able to do it if we wander uh, or if we move recklessly, but our chances of wandering are pretty pretty good. Why don't we why don't we try that? I think this turn, instead of moving during the day, uh, for our third game turn, we're going to move during the night. So we're going to be rolling on this side of the board um, for the circumstance phase. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six, um, and you can move six recklessly. So we're actually moving recklessly. And if we uh, take a look at moving recklessly, each hero suffers two energy drain, and you have to choose one of the two skills to automatically fail. So I think we're gonna try and go for some, some gold here. Um, so we are going to consume some food instead. So I will just reduce that right away. And we are going to roll our green and our yellow. <laughs> That's a crit fail for uh, our warlock here. We have a fail and a 10. Uh, so we failed everything. We are definitely going to wander. We still have uh, Poe with us, the missionary. So we can roll a 10-sided uh, die for him for the navigate. He rolls an eight, and his skill is a seven, so he also fails. So uh, we are going to wander as part of our movement. Hopefully, we're going to roll a one and wander right into that monastery. That's a four. No dice. So a four is actually going to be moving us further away. We were off course by quite a bit. <clears throat> And uh, that is where we're going to end our movement phase. So the next thing that's going to happen is we are going to roll uh, our circumstance. We are going to, um, oh, actually, we don't roll because of last turn. The group must face a tenacious encounter for their circumstance next turn. So we have to draw a circumstance. And we have a hanged man, uh, level one, undead. So we are going to write down uh, the vitals on the battle mat. He has four health and four energy. Uh, we gain a clue and, and one gold each, two food each, if we defeat him. Now, um, we move during the night, and so if you'll notice, there are some passive abilities on this particular uh, encounter. You're always going to want to read the passive abilities before you begin facing your encounter, and that is at the bottom. So if we look, this encounter has hatred utility. So that means if we had a utility hero, um, they would be uh, more likely to be targeted and suffer more damage from this particular uh, opponent. Now, it also is going to ambush us. Check it out. If we move during the night, and we did, we move during the night, ambush, group navigate. Those who fail suffer one health damage. So we have to all suffer, or we all have to roll navigate. Eight, miss. So our witch takes one health damage. Warlock, four, misses. He is going to take one health damage. And then Poe, because Poe has a Navigate score, he can roll in this particular action. So he rolls a three, Poe suffers no damage. All right, so 
that is the extent of our ambush. He automatically gets something that happens before combat begins. Now we get to attempt to take him out. He is an undead creature uh, or an undead opponent. We do not have favored opponent against undead. We have favored opponent against monstrous humanoid and monstrous humanoid for both of our races. So we are going to declare what we're going to do. I'm going to have my warlock use arcane bolt, which costs him three energy to deal eight health damage. So I'm going to write that on our battle mat here. Um, as you can see, he doesn't have eight health to even take. So hopefully if this goes through, we will be able to um, destroy him right away. Wretch, uh, I think, is just going to do... Um, Wretch is just going to defend. And now with the witch, you begin the game with a familiar of your choice, and you may use your familiar's ability rank in place of your defend rank. So uh, Wretch's um, familiar is the viper, and the viper's um, rank is currently three, which is actually one rank higher than the witch's. So the witch is going to defend with her viper's uh, defend value. Let's see what the hangman does. We roll a one, single, two health, and it heals one health. So it's gonna heal one, uh, taking away from that eight damage. It's, doesn't gonna, it's not gonna matter because we did more than uh, five total health. So he will die. Uh, let's go ahead and see who actually is the target. Let's go with green for the warlock, yellow for the witch, and blue for Poe. Yellow is a 10. The 10 is going to be um, the, the target. Now that is the witch, and the witch defended at a rank of three, so that single two health damage is um, absorbed by her defend value. So we locked out there, that was good. And we destroy the hanged man. So if we, you'll note, we have a group bonus of a clue. We get to place a clue wherever we would like to place it. Um, and let's go ahead and place the clue on this one right here. The, um, the, dual, the dual one at the bottom. All right, we get one gold and two food each. So I'm not sure what we're actually eating but uh, hopefully it's, it's not mysterious meat pies. All right, so that is the end of our circumstance phase. We are not on an event location that moves us into uh, the, the villain phase. We are going to, first of all, at the beginning of the villain phase, we're gonna add blood based on the number of collectors on the board. There's one, so our blood meter will increase by one. Okay, and then we are going to roll on the table. Now, we move recklessly this turn. So if you'll note, <clears throat> the game turns placard shows that we actually have a minus two bonus to our villain action die. So we actually got ahead of Noctis this turn. We moved uh, faster than his spies were able to keep an eye on us. So we're gonna roll a d12, we get an eight, which is minus two, and we find that the group gains a plus two penalty to stat tests made next game turn. So uh, that is going to mean that whatever we roll stat, tests, stat test next turn, we have a plus two penalty. All right. <clears throat> so that is the end of game turn three. Moving into game turn four, uh, we are going to, let's move to that other monastery. So in this particular case, check it out. We're right next to a river. So we can move one onto the river, two, uh, again, a river hex, and three, a fourth, uh, a third river hex right to that monastery. That means we're moving cautiously, and it means that um, it, we're not going to wander from this location. So we're guaranteed to make it to that spot. Now, I didn't actually select day or night, so we should do that first. 
Let's go ahead and select day. Um, we're not going to have a circumstance, but that's okay. It, it may affect other things that happen during this particular turn. So we move during the day. We move cautiously. We're going to roll our skills. And we gain a plus two penalty to these because they are stat tests, because Noctis was able to, um, to interfere with our plans. <clears throat> so we're avoiding uh, blood collectors in this area and trying to outsmart, outsmart them. Um, we're traveling along the river as safely as we can uh, despite that. And it looks like we've failed everything here. Uh, our warlock is going to go back down to zero food again. Let's roll for the witch. And she fails everything as well. She would have actually made navigate. Um, but because of that penalty, Noctis has interfered. And she also is going to consume food. All right, one last thing is we are still going to roll the navigate for Poe. He may actually get a um, uh, critical success, and that could give us a, a something uh, on the board. It's a four, so he does not get anything. It would have actually been a plus two as a, as a six. So, All right, so that's the skill phase. Uh, we skip the circumstance phase. Again, we are in the uh, monastery. And that means we're going to have this trigger once again. And if we uh, note, each time you bring him to a new monastery, gain this card's rune reward, that means we get another uh, green rune. And we're in a new, um, a new uh, monastery. Let's see, where is the monastery placard right here? Here it is. Let's see, this is monastery number one. So that is Domiel. We're going to write a one in the green rune reward um, to denote that we've actually turned in a rune there. And we're going to gain another power up. Ah, all right. So we have drawn a plus three to survival, which is an awesome card. And we've drawn a favored opponent block ability. So keep this card when drawn. While you have this card, whenever you face a favorite opponent, you may choose to gain block against them instead of affecting their vitals. Um, so this just gives us more uh, options when we're facing favorite opponents. So let's go with uh, the favorite opponent is going to go to our witch. <clears throat> and survival is going to go to our warlock who now has it rank six in survival. That's gonna help us do this hidden uh, giant uh, investigation later in the game. So that's definitely a good thing. All right, so if we note this favorite opponent card has a plus two, again, it's a plus two uh, to the villain action modifier. So we are going to be um, penalized one more time and uh, we are going to be um, looking at what those effects might be. Okay, I think we have done the rest of that turn. Let's go ahead and move into the villain phase. We have to add one to the uh, blood pool. And then we are going to roll uh, the d12, the moon die. We're going to see what the villain has in store for us this turn. Nine plus two is an 11. And if we note, 11 is the uh, collector. Another collector is going to appear on the board. Now we move during the day. We selected that at the beginning of the turn. So we are going to roll a six-sided die, um, and we're going to see which of the villages a blood collector appears in. And that is number five. So right next to us. No wonder those, um, those collectors were we're hampering what we've, what we've been doing. So that is now two blood collectors in villages. Um, and you can still go to these locations and, and they are still villages. But if you go to a, a village during the night, you have a, the opportunity to face collectors there. So you can actually seek them out and destroy them if you wish. Um, but only during the night. You can't do that during the day. All right. 
So that is the end of game turn number four. Let's do one more game turn just to um, just to show you guys a, a, another example. Um, so game turn num number five. Let's go ahead and we're gonna move during the day, and uh, let's move. Let's move two. One two, and that's gonna put two new uh, locations, two new hex tiles on the board. Oh, look at that. We've found Noctis' castle. So we will place that over here. And we have found um, the third boss. And we have found another random boss location. So we're going to place that. Let's place that right here. And that is going to be our movement phase. I think we're only going to move two. Um, so we have moved normally. We're going to roll uh, our dice. And we make survival this time, so that's good. The warlock has no more food to, to lose. He does have blessed rations, so he could consume that in place of food. Um, but we don't have to this turn because he rolled a little pretty well. We have a three on explore. His rank is only a two, so he gains no gold. And we roll a 10 on our navigate, so we uh, stay and we, we fail that, and we may wander. Let's roll for the witch. A nine, a nine, and a nine. Wow. Uh, so that was very poor. We have failed everything. The witch is, is out of her elements moving during the day. Um, let's roll navigate for the missionary. And it's a six. The missionary makes the navigate roll. Now, in order for you to, to not wander, you actually need to um, roll half the heroes, uh, half the group needs to succeed, um, round it up. So in this case, half the group rounded up would be two. Um, and so that means we still wander. We're going to roll a d6. And that is going to be wandering south. We wander back to the river. Okay, that is the movement phase and the skill phase. Now we're going to roll on the, um, on the circumstance phase. We're going to roll a d6, and that's a 5. A 5 is an encounter, so let's see what that is. Oh, it's a devil. Okay, so this uh, opponent um, actually has something new um, to, to showcase, and that is Agus. Now, if you take a look at both of these opponents, um, note that the shield looks different. There's a shield icon on the hanged man that shows one. Um, and then there's a shield icon on the devil, uh, which is in orange and has a different color text. Um, it's uh, level two, but it also has a gear upgrade icon right below it. Now, this icon, the orange shield and the gear upgrade below it, is denoting Agus. And Agus basically means that it's harder for you to um, to hit these particular creatures. Um, so let's take a look at what Agus is. We'll pull out our key, keywords placard, and that's going to give you the information on that. Um, Agus is represented by an orange shield and often replaces the opponent's level shield. Heroes may only deal health damage to these opponents if they have a number of attack gear upgrades equal to or greater than half the Agus value, rounded up, or if the opponent's energy is zero, unless otherwise specified the Agus value is equal to the opponent's level. So let's, let's take a closer look at what that means. Basically, our heroes need to have at least one attack gear upgrade, as denoted by the symbol, uh, in order to deal health damage to this, or this particular opponent has to have zero energy for us to deal health damage. So if you have a sapper in the group, you can take their energy away and now you can get to their health. Um, but thankfully, both of our heroes at the beginning of the game, we purchased one attack gear upgrade. We didn't purchase. We used one of our uh, starting gear upgrades for attack. And so that means that we can actually uh, attack this, this guy normally.
All right, so he's going to give us three gold and three food. So let's get out our battle mat, write down his vitals here. We have uh, nine and five, so nine health, five energy. Let's go with <clears throat> our warlock is going to do arcane bolt for eight. And wretch, our witch, is going to do four. Uh, four for a total of 13 damage if we can if we can get away with that so out of nine health uh he is he's going to be uh destroyed unless he does something uh to counter us this turn um so we're going to roll a d6 poe our missionary does not have an attack value or a defend value so he's kind of uh, skulking in the shadows hoping that we can uh you know take care of the, of this devil that, that we're fighting we're gonna roll a d6 and we get a three. So a three is its mastery ability. Uh, it spends two energy to do this uh, ability. And group all skills. Each hero suffers one health and one energy damage for each of their failed rolls. Double this damage if any if any hero critically fails. Oh man, so we are gonna roll our skills. Could you imagine if we got this card on the turn where we're doing minus two to our skills? That was last turn, thankfully. Um, but if if Mirza Noctis had kind of countered our plans this turn, our crit range would have been uh, m much higher. So let's see what we have here. A two, a hex, and a seven. Uh, well, that's great. So he actually makes the blue and he makes um, navigate with a two. His rank is two. Uh, so we made two out of the three. So currently he's going to suffer one health and one energy. Let's see what the witch does. Four, four hex. Uh, and she has made everything except for explore. So again, both of these two heroes are going to, um, to suffer, uh, two, Or I'm sorry, one health and energy damage, bringing our warlock down to five health and our witch down to um, five health. Okay, last but not least, we have an escort in the group. He is not a hero, but he can roll navigate. So we will be rolling for him. Let's see what uh, he does here. We get a five. A five is a success. Uh, his navigate score is a seven. So that means he will not suffer that uh, damage. Now, the devil is defeated. We managed to do 13, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 damage to the uh, encounter, and that is going to defeat him. Now we've already taken our damage and uh, we need to gain our rewards, which is three gold and three food per hero. We have four, we're up to uh, six food for Wretch. Thankfully now we have three food for Nalus. And um, we are done with that card. All right, so we can take these guys and put them back. We vanquished a devil. Let's bring our dice back here. Okay, and next we are going to have, uh, let's see, that was the uh, circumstance phase. Next we're going to have an event, um, only if we're on an event location, which we are not. So we are now going to have the villain phase. Um, now, <clears throat> we don't have any modifiers for this particular game turn, so let's see what Noctis has in store for us this turn. We have two blood collectors on the board now, um, so we're going to increase the blood meter by two, and let's roll the moon die. We get a two, a two. Group one piercing energy drain. So each of us is going to suffer one piercing energy drain as well as our missionary. So our, our missionary is going to go down to five health. 
record that on the battle mat. Um, and then we're going to uh, suffer each of our heroes. And that is going to end our fifth game turn. So we have quite a bit ahead of us yet. Um, this is going to be the end of this particular video, but if I were to go on, I think we would be trying for a boss next turn. Um, we might camp in place just to get some of our vitals back before we do that, um, but we still have our missionary in the group as well. So maybe we could expand the map and find uh, the rest of the monasteries. That would be a, a quite an easy way to go. Um, and we could also try for one of the, the boss locations, which is, which is right next door. So I hope you guys had a great time watching. Um, this is obviously, uh, uh, just such a, a great time for us to be able to build this game. And we're so thankful, uh, that we have such an awesome community that is behind us, uh, supporting us. So thanks again. Uh, until next time, have a great time, uh, in your adventures.